Welcome to this Start Now session on building a foundation in automation. My name is Dewan Lightfoot, and today I am joined by the 2021 DevNet Creator Award winner and author, John Capabianco. What's up, John? Hey, Dewan. How are you, man? Thanks for having me here at Create Again. I'm really excited about today's session, and it's really good to see you and collaborating with you again. Hey man, I'm excited to do this session with you as well. So today on our session, John, we, we kind of talked offline about what it takes to build a foundation in automation. And when we got together, we came up with six key points for building a foundation in automation. You care to start us off with the first key point that we talked about? Well, if you're watching this, you've really already taken the first step and it's to participate in the community and to join this growing movement and uh, evolution and revolution in the way we solve problems with networks. And that is to plug into the communities available. This community of DevNet is growing, it's grown exponentially since I was introduced to it at Cisco Live in 2017. That was my first interaction with, with what, what became this really big, amazing movement called DevNet. So um, we've listed some community platforms here, including Twitter, and in particular, Twitter Spaces, which has become very popular. I actually joined an automation-focused uh, weekly Twitter space, Thursday nights, hosted by uh, Cisco DevNet. And every week it's a new topic, it's new discovery, it's new learning, it's meeting and connecting with more and more people every week. I also see that YouTube's listed here and Duan and I, we just, I think we stopped at almost two and a half hours on your YouTube channel uh, in our discussion about my work in the open source community and getting to know each other. and. Um, just a wonderful conversation that has almost 2,000 views in just a few weeks. Uh, so your community reach on YouTube, Duan. I have a YouTube channel. There's many amazing YouTube channels out there to get you started with automation as your foundation. And that's what we're talking about is, 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 is using like automate principles where you look at solving every problem through a lens of programmability, and APIs and automation. And the community is a great place to plug into um, other, what other developers are doing. Juan, what do you think about the community platforms? I totally agree. Um, I wouldn't be where I am in my career without community, whether it's being a network engineer or a software developer. At some point in your career, you're trying to figure it out. So. If you're trying to get a certification or you're trying to learn a new skill or you're just looking for the next new thing that you need to learn, Twitter, LinkedIn, and all of these platforms have people like yourself and many others that are just actively helping and putting out information to help people advance. So I think a community is very important. Yeah, and um, I know I get a lot of uh, questions about how do, how do you do it? <laughs> There's a lot of magic involved in my project called Merlin, but we see the resources column and I, I, I would not have my open source project without some of these key resources and, and actually being able to share my work with people and to find mentors and find people that want to be mentored through things like the automation exchange and the code exchange and GitHub repositories. The sandbox is, is, we talked about this offline, there's a difference between production and a lab, but sometimes not even a lab can be a suitable place to do free development without constraints. The DevNet sandboxes, and there's so many of them for any use case, you want a Nexus 9000, you just type in Nexus and you have one available for free on demand in, in just a few clicks where you can try to play with APIs and develop Python without ever impacting anything in your real world, so to speak, environment. Um, 
And what do you think about these platforms, Duan? Yes. You know, I know, I, sorry, I know you're super involved in, I'm sorry to cut you off. I know that you're heavily involved in the start now. I should have handed off to you that way. Um, Duan, what do you think about the start now program in particular and how it can be a foundation for automation? For sure. It's all good, John. So as a developer advocate for Cisco DevNet, I'm over the start now content and I'm all about helping people get started in automation. Now, where your starting point is, it's going to differ depending on the person. You may be brand new to coding, so you need an introduction to APIs and coding 101, or you may want to get started with SD WAN or ACI. Start now has the content curated and ready to go to meet you exactly where you are whether you're an engineer trying to get started with DevNet and Cisco network automation, or you're a app application developer and you're trying to get started with Cisco DevNet, we have the content curated to meet you exactly where you are. Now, when it comes to getting started, sometimes you need a platform to get started on. And that's where I think the real power comes in with the sandboxes that you mentioned, whether it's SD-WAN, ACI, Nexus, NXOS, we have sandboxes that you can reserve. And then we also have sandboxes that are always on. I know when I was a network engineer, the ACI always on sandbox and a couple other sandboxes that were always on, I would constantly write Postman um, API calls to structure my API calls the way I want and then be able to write my Python script exactly the way I needed to because I have a sandbox to be able to test my code. So these resources that you mentioned, along with GitHub and all of the other platforms, I totally agree with that. Yeah, and, and, and it's really, we're just scraping the surface here. We don't have a lot of time and we could talk about, you know, just GitHub probably for 40 minutes or just the automation exchange. I know as a contributor of code, what I really appreciate about something about like the code exchange and the automation exchange beyond just GitHub, um, they, they have their own ecosystem and their own search form and people looking specifically for automation solutions can go to the automation exchange and do keyword searches on things like Ansible, things like PyETS, um, API, just keyword searches to get your ideas and see what other people have submitted to the community. Um, if you've written code that you want to share, you also get a nice little badge and a nice code review from Cisco when you submit to these exchanges. Cisco actually helped me sort out my open source licensing with suggestions about what files I should put in my repository. And, and I didn't even think of that angle until I submitted to the code exchange. The other one on here I want to mention that's been very key to my success and my constant lifelong learning is the digital learning portal, Cisco Digital Learning. Now, there is a free three-day trial as well to this. This is a paid service, but when you want to maybe focus and hyper-focus on something like DNA Center or SDA, for me, you know, I have the official study guide. I keep it right beside me here for DevNet Associate, but the, the additional materials through the digital learning portal really helped me prepare um, for that exam. So that's a very key part of my learning process. And you actually get credits, Duan, when you successfully complete a course that you can actually use to renew your, your NP or NA level certifications, which I just came to discover as well. That's a great point, John. And by the way, congratulations on your DevNet Associates. Hey, thank you. I, I really, it's a really big part of my success was preparing for that. It goes hand in hand with my open source work, which I started to, um, you know, build a practical um, example of code so I could learn, you know, the different techniques and the different code. It's, it's a very wide exam, but one of the best experiences I've had writing exams was the DevNet Associate um, it was really tactile. It was grounded in real world challenges and problems. And I, I, I encourage everybody to, to go get your DevNet Associate. Yes. Now, John, 
when we talk about community and we have a plan on where we want to go or what we want to accomplish with automation. Now, the next key point that we need to talk about is what are we going to develop in? I think we need a playground to actually start putting our ideas together in code. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. The community is going to give you some great ideas and maybe some hints on where to start or some how-to guides, blogs, YouTube videos. You're going to have some ideas and you're going to want to start to become creative with those ideas. And like Duan said, you need a playground to take those ideas and turn them into code. That's that's what that's a real key foundation here is your integrated development environment. There's a um a funny story go that floats around about how I started writing automation solutions in Ansible using Notepad. Um, you can look from my early mistakes <laughs> that there is much better, much better experiences and tools that help you write your code and solutions and transform those ideas into working code, um, right? Development, it's in, the, it's in the name, an IDE. And we wanna transition into you know, developers, not necessarily just network operators or engineers. And a thing that really helped me cross the divide, Duan, was finding VS Code. And that happens to be my ID of choice, but this isn't to necessarily pick the best or worst one or to rank them. It's to bring the idea of transforming your ideas using an actual tool that will help you and assist you write code. What, what are your thoughts, Duan? That's a great point. Um, when I started Python development, I started with PyCharm. And I really like enjoy using Python. I mean PyCharm during that time, but at some point I got introduced to VS Code and I noticed the differences between the two. One of them that one of them that I noticed just constantly stood out was that VS Code was so lightweight. And when I would execute code in VS Code, it would perform a lot faster. And for me, I was able to get up and running in a quicker amount of time than it took me in PyCharm. So I made the shift to VS Code and it actually improved my workflow. And I think that's one of the most important things is finding the workflow that works for you and finding the IDE or tools that work for you. What's your thoughts, John? I totally agree. And, and it's, a, it's very subjective. What I liked about VS Code was that um, every new discovery and it's an evolution and it's a growth and you're gonna find new languages and new ways of doing things. There seemed to be an extension to help me <laughs> with, with everything that I was trying to start to develop with, be it um, YAML files or JSON files, or even more advanced things like um, an actual Django framework or a Kubernetes or a Docker compose file. I mean, any sing every one of these things I come across my IDE seem to have extensions to help me learn and adopt these new, um, the color coding in Python, the Git differentials that we can use with something like Git Lens. It, it really, it, it's, it's quite magical compared to, and you think they're just flat text files. They're no different. You could still open these same files in Notepad and they would work. Um, but we have this whole extra layers of, of like our list here, syntax highlighting and linting. Linting is one of my favorite things that it will actually call out to you. This is potentially a mistake and it will save you hours potentially of compiling code that's not written properly. You can catch it early in your development phase. That's what I think is the big difference here with IDEs is is you can they help you fail fast is that's how i would describe it what do you think totally agree from the syntax highlighting when you're um, writing your code to the linting to let you know exactly where you have issues in your code to the point of when you modify a file in version control it lets you know that there have been changes in your code you can visually see see this rather than having to go to command line and using the git command or git commands to verify when changes have happened in um, your staging area of your code. So 
I, for one, always use an IDE when I code, but I know people that don't. More advanced Python, Python developers may not need it. May not need it, but for me, in my workflow, it improves everything about my process of developing code. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I find less and less, I'm even leaving VS Code. <laughs> Um, there was a time where you had to say remote into a Linux host and SSH into a remote device and do something remotely. Well, now, right, the tools improved and there's remote connection utilities that just plug in where you can develop remotely locally in your VS code. It just keeps getting better and better and there's less and less friction. I'm on any GitHub repository now, if you change the .com, to .dev, try that right now. If you're watching this video, find your favorite GitHub repository and change the .com to .dev. It will give you a VS Code-like experience now right inside of your browser. That's how widespread this has become. So I, I'm really excited if, if you've never tried an IDE and you're gonna watch this video and actually install one, you're in for, you're in for a real surprise and a real change of approach. Like I said, um, just a few years ago when I started using these tools in this way, my, my whole experience as a problem solver has, has become better and I enjoy it. And I, I don't have, ha, ha, there's, there's so less friction involved now that I've connected version control and an IDE. And we're going to talk more and more about these tools, but it really is a, a a radically new way of working if you're traditionally used to, you know, say a network CLI and Notepad++. That's a great point. And you bring up tools, which is our next topic. When it comes to tools, John, we, how did you find your tool to help you get started in code? You want to kind of talk about that? Yeah, I'd love to. So, I started, we have, we've made a distinction in the slides between a programming language, and you see a list there, Python and Golang and Java and JavaScript, and domain-specific languages, which um, are an abstraction layer that you don't necessarily have to know the programming languages on the left slide. You can start and pick up Ansible, where I started, and where I, I, I eventually wrote a book about it because um, I was so, it was such a transformation for me to have this foundation and automation now that I seem to be able to solve many problems just by adopting the domain specific language. And over time, it actually led me to adopting more and more programming languages. I still use both and I use them not necessarily interchangeably, but they have their place and you can use one just as effectively as the other it's they're tools that's why this slide is called tools sometimes you pick up a screwdriver sometimes you pick up a hammer it depends if you're dealing with a nail or a screw and i really think that that may be a simple analogy but it really depends on your use case and the problem you're trying to solve so now that we've picked an ide it's time to right? Find your tools. You can't build it with your bare hands. That idea in your head is not going to manifest itself unless you find some tools to help you do this, right? This is the equivalent of picking up a canvas and a paintbrush, picking your colors or an oil or acrylic, right? There's, there's different pros and cons of mediums, but the point is to start expressing yourself artistically using these tools, right? That would be my equivalent or a sculptor or a piano player, right? There's, there's, you can pick your instrument, a guitar or a piano or a drum, but the point is to start making music, right? Of course, of course. And depending on the instrument that you enjoy playing, you know, Ansible may be that tool that gets the job done. And people ask me often, Python or Ansible, which one should I get started with? And I tell them, well, 
Ansible has its benefits and it may be um, a easier barrier of entry to start with Ansible, but Python has its own benefits as well. And you can do a lot more in Python, but the barrier to entry in Python may be a little higher than starting with Ansible. So depending on what your problem is, you have to actually find the best tool and then find the tool that you're most comfortable with. And then learn that and work that tool until it does not work anymore for you or you have time to learn a new tool that you can adapt or migrate to. What's your thoughts, John? I'm asked the question a lot. And um, again, I don't, I don't think there's any wrong, right? Uh, either is better than nothing, <laughs> right? Perfect is the enemy of great. And something is always better than nothing. Now, what I would suggest people do, because it's the tool, is maybe pick something simple. The show version command, both Ansible and Python or other tools, um, will let you programmatically transform that legacy show version CLI command into something like JavaScript object notation. And relatively easy enough to do with both a domain specific language. Um, people tend to make mis right. I, I jump want to write jump to configuration management. And can I change something? I don't want to say that's a mistake, but if you're brand new at this, that might be a little bit of friction. That might be like trying the hurdles instead of the hundred meter dash, right? There's things you're going to have to jump over in your path. It's not just a straight dash to the finish. So pick something easy, pick something non-intrusive to your network, a show command that's valuable to you. Um, try it in the YAML way, right? With Ansible and a playbook as it's known with a host file. And then maybe try the same thing Pythonically with something like PyATS. You're going to find similarities and differences. You're going to find comfort or ease or difficulty in both ways. And I think then it's up to you to make an informed uh, decision, right? Yes, totally. Make an informed decision and find out which is works better for you. Um, for me, I never really dove into Ansible because I didn't need to. I started with Python and Python that did everything that I needed to do. And then in the organization that I was in, we had pipelines that pretty much were all written in Python. So for me, Python has always been the tool of choice. And Ansible, it can do the job. It can do the job great. But at this point, you know, I'm moving on to Terraform and using Terraform for a lot of things rather than Ansible because that's the tool that is performing in the areas that I need. So I think you have to find out what works for you, just like you just like you mentioned. And then also be curious when it comes to these tools. Be curious because there's always something new out there and there's always a different way to do the same thing. You just have to find what works for you. And I think one thing, and I, you know, I don't want to um, frighten anyone, but there's a key concept to understand about your foundation and automation. Really, it boils down to a um, imperative or declarative, right? It's either sort of serially executed commands, Google's very good at this, or it's a declared state. And I'm telling a piece of infrastructure that I want it to be in this end state completely, not like a serialized function, like almost a, and in the networking world, you could think about the analogy to config replace. Um, and again, we can also use things like REST APIs now, Duan, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, but you can achieve that declarative automation Pythonically with something like the request library and posting a, a totality config through JSON or the Yang models or other techniques. Again, a wide landscape of tools here um, on both sides, uh, lang even programming languages. Uh, Golang is becoming very appealing because of the, the compiled executable nature of the solution. And and the reduction of friction of per, 
you know, Python virtual environments and things of that nature, right? So things are always changing and we're always growing and learning. I think the key here though, is that we've got our IDE and it's time to start putting our solutions on paper, so to speak, um, in a .py file or a .yaml file, right? It's, it, start writing that code, right, Go on. Yes, of course. Now, John, now that we have our community, we built a strong foundation in the community, as well as we have a playground to develop our code in the IDE. And now we have a tool that we can use to start developing code. Now we need to talk about the next thing of when we modify our code, how do we track those changes in our code? Let's talk about version control and using Git or GitHub or both. What's your thoughts on this, John? Well, this is this is my favorite slide because it comes to sort of experience of a pre-version control world for me where files like John underscore V3 underscore new different file production, I think YAML. Um, if that sounds familiar to you, you know, underscore V2 files, things of that nature, you, you really should start turning to um, a, a version control system and specifically Git. We are in a real post-Git world, I think, Duan, where everything from network automation solutions, storage, compute, applications, web pages, everything is really tracked and become Git enabled, let's say. And for anyone maybe wondering why distinction here between Git, the actual version control software, let's call it, a local version control, and the remote repositories, things like GitHub or GitLab or Azure DevOps or Bitbucket, that there's a distinction there, right, Duan? Of course, yes. When it comes to Git and versus our GitHub and version control, Git is going to be your local repository. So all the changes that you make on your local system, you'll be able to track on your local system. It isn't really built for collaboration or sharing your code or doing pull requests or things like that. Now, when you want to collaborate or you want to store your code in a remote location, just in case something happens to your local system, this is when you're going to use a remote repository like GitHub, which is the one that I use, but there's also GitLab, Bitbucket, and many others that will allow you to store your code on a remote server and then also be able to collaborate with other team members or others in the industry like John or myself, where we can look at your code, sample your code, download your code, or even add or collaborate on your code. What's your thought, John? Yeah, exactly. It's it's a deep connection to the community can be made through through GitHub pull requests and helping other people write code, um, having others help you write your code or run your code or test your code. Just incredible. And I, and I mean, it, this is it's hard for me to really sometimes comprehend, but at a worldwide scale, I have pull requests from from Russia, from Brazil, from South Africa. It, it really is incredible to me, the reach and the power of collaborative code through these remote repositories. Um, and you had mentioned something about collaboration and uh, that, really, that really struck me is, is that we, we can solve problems as a team now because of the elegance and simplicity of the Git system. Now, you it can be difficult. <laughs> you can get into some trouble with Git. But this idea of a branching system, and what I really, what what really clicked with me, someone mentioned or explained it to me as a way to protect working code. Sometimes you make something work, and has this ever happened to you where you've changed something, you've tweaked something, you've developed or you've refactored, you've modified the code, and now it doesn't work. It stops working. How, how, without this idea of version control, finding out what change made, you know, broke your solution, what, what, what 
negative code was introduced, it becomes very easy and it and almost it's it's almost self-explanatory with Git and the version control to say working code on the left side of the screen, non-working code on the right side of the screen, what was added or removed from both sides. And you say, ah, oh, right there, that should have been, I don't know, a text field instead of a Boolean field, whatever the change you made was. And again, leaning on one of our earlier foundational tools, the IDE, these things work together really to show you, John, here's what you've changed. And um, this is probably what you've, what were the mistake lies. But can you maybe speak to the power of like, really, when you put some of these things together, we've talked about Duan, you can really become a, a, you know, a full developer making solutions that have a change log and a history and a rich development life cycle, right? Yes, you can develop an entire pipeline to where you develop your code on your local system and then you push it to a remote system, at which point you can have integration testing to verify that the code that you're pushing to pr production or to a development environment is actually been tested and verified for any changes that may break the existing stable deployment of the code. So you can really have a lot of power by leveraging version control. But John, we talked about version control. We talked about our tools and our IDEs. The question I have for you, that's um, traditional networking engineer. We're kind of talking about automation and deploying. What do you think about REST and APIs? I, I think they are... Um... So do you ever wonder how we got to this magical world around us of streaming services and, and everything it seems at our fingertips and on demand and these, these giant social networks, but instant real time, it, it really, it all because of the API. We live in a post rest API society, really. This technology changed the web. When we hear about iterations of the web 1.0, and the web 2.0, and I hear rumblings of web 3.0, but I don't want to bring that up. But what changed in the web was really this idea of REST APIs. Now for us as network engineers, we should be excited because the bullet point says moving past the CLI. If you've ever had to log into multiple devices, CLI and troubleshoot a difficult problem or make configuration changes, or just find out what's going on with the network. Any on all problems that have built up over the 30 years of the network industry and the limitations of the command line interface have been, right, we've moved past those to use REST APIs and an application programmable interface. There's still interfaces, right? It's the same conceptual idea but we've moved transport to HTTPS, ideally. We can do CRUD activities, create, read, update, delete. Now think about typically in the networking space, right, we call it maybe a MACD, a move, add, change, or deletion, similar idea. But these create, read, update, delete can now be done programmatically at scale without the friction of connecting to a secure area of the network and then getting your key fob out and logging into the command line and logging the session to putty. It, it, you can do it through the, the API. And I'm really, really excited about this. And Guam, what's really neat, this has pushed itself right down into the access layers of a Cisco network, right at the edge where your devices are connecting. We can turn something like REST comp on on the catalyst line in our campus, NX API on in our data center, all of the wonderful appliances, DNA center, ACI, Prime, ICE, the ICE APIs are incredible. I could go on and on and on about the API libraries and that are available to us. WebEx APIs, uh, uh, just amazing that you can send an adaptive card 
to a WebEx channel that's full of network state information. I've done this. I've gone as far, Duan, using APIs as to making a phone call from the network when an interface was unplugged. That's how excited I am about, about what we can do with APIs. Have the network phone me and say, hey, John, there's a problem on port two. It's been unplugged. That it's it's magic. It really that's why I called my open source product Merlin, because it, it all feels so magical to me what we can do with a simple bit of structured data, right? The XML or JSON, typically JSON, but that structured data compared to standard command line output, it it's it's the difference between making fire with rocks and having a lighter i think that's to me that's the difference what do you what do you think i know i get i get carried away about apis i get really fired up about those but <laughs> when we talk about foundations for automation this is going to be your new foundation the cli will life cycle away and more and more content more and more content is going to be focused on the api ecosystems uh, what do you think, Duan? Yeah, um, so I totally agree. When we talk about our four key points previous to this point with the community, the IDE, the tools, and using GitHub and version control, all of those can be, you know, around our traditional network engineers or in engineers and developers because we have been using those tools for years. But now the industry is adapting to using APIs and controller-based networks, where now you, rather than touching device to, by device in the CLI, now we're leveraging these APIs and talking to a controller like Cisco DNA Center or ACI or another controller where we push that the changes and configurations northbound, and now the controller is pushing the changes to the devices southbound. So the way we actually develop and manage our networks is evolving and i i am here for it i am really passionate about where the industry is going it, it's incredible and and what is really exciting is they solve real problems on the right side about apis in action um i mean we could talk about this for hours there's postman collections out there um even like they're very accessible it's the entire Cisco library of APIs in a collection out there on Postman and on Cisco DevNet. You can find these collections ready to go pre-canned API calls that you can just start using a very friendly, easy browser-like tool in Postman to start leveraging these APIs. The other one that really excites me is the SmartNet Total Care. And I mean, I solving real world problems am i at risk what right we hear about this dangerous world we live in and i want to really highlight this how you can use something like an api to help protect work the 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 p cert or product security incident response teams api you send it you know information from your network what you're running and it will tell you whether or not you're vulnerable what vulnerabilities you have how to fix them and what, what versions remediate them. That's just one API. There's serial to contract information. Do you have trouble dealing with at scale your contract management, right? Not so much necessarily OSI stack routing OSPF problems, right? The real world involves more than just technical networking sometimes, right, Duan? I have all these parts. Probably. Are they under contract? When do they expire? how you know what's my service level agreement on them that layer eight stuff there's an api for that um just just in, just an incredibly new approach a radical big data at our fingertips to help guide our approach and solve real world problems agree agree but john now that we've covered our six key points of community, IDEs, tools, version control, and REST and APIs. The last and most important thing is, what you think? Embracing the journey. You want to kind of close, close Embrace the journey. So 
this is a real key to to anyone's success is finding enjoyment and and loving and passion and what you do and i think embracing the journey has been the key to my success and um because i found a way to have lifelong learning in this feedback loop of failures and successes it can be difficult to write code and to solve problems and to do things maybe no one else has ever tried before to fail embrace these failures don't look at them as failures you've learned something something only yet it only fails until it works and then it works and you don't have to worry about the failure right you, it, once you've succeeded and once it clicks and what's what's very interesting is it's almost like the hydra <laughs> you're going to you're going to solve one problem and three more problems are going to emerge through this world of programming and and it's constant challenge it's constant feedback of failing and learning and succeeding um and i think these key points you're going to have a community behind you we started with community if we wrap up with community they're going to be there to embrace those failures and help you land on your feet and and work through problems and they're going to be there to celebrate your successes together this in this journey you don't have to take it by yourself it's embracing the journey along the way i've met duan and him and i now are taking the journey together which is incredible to me in this world where we live in in a post right our our whole society's changed duan we're isolated some of us are still under lockdown some of us haven't seen family and friends in person in a while the community and it, as i've made more friends <laughs> digital friends and digital connections that are that we all just let's take the journey together okay i've i've met some people in from all around the world and we're learning together and we're failing together and we're succeeding together and our dreams are being realized and i'm just so excited and appreciative of of the cisco's you know uh, I've, I've rewarding me with an award this year. Uh, I'm beside myself. Um, but that's what this journey can be all about. Um, if you want to use me for inspiration, you know, 20 years ago, I, I worked in an aluminum factory on a heavy, heavy gauge machine for 12 hours, if you can believe it. But I invested in myself and I went back to school and I've embraced this journey. And here I am 20 years later, receiving one of the industry's highest awards in in developing software and solutions so 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 right you can do it right you can start this journey you can embrace this journey and you may meet great people along the way like duan and all of the great people at cisco and devnet so duan what do you think man what do you what do you want to say about the journey hey john first thing i want to say is that Thank you for all that you do for the community. Thank you for being a part of this session. And um, thank you for constant supporting and encouraging me personally. And to everyone that is on this journey, just like the slide says, embrace the journey. You're going to be learning. You're going to fail, but you only fail if you give up. The community is here to support you. Cisco's here to support you. John's here to support you. And I'm here to support you. Keep at it and DevNet is here to support you. We thank you all for joining us. Thanks, John. Thank you, Duan. And thank you to Cisco DevNet Create for having me here today. And for everyone who spent this, you know, time with us today. Stay safe. Yes, take care.